Assalamu alaikum family and friends this is editor chat number 31 welcome back um, you can see that in preparation for our guest today who is none other than Pasha Taufik Pasha Muraj I have brought an offering that is no better than any way of studying sacred geometry divine geometry nature's beauty local indigenous flora and of course this is um, I'm not sure if any of you will recognize this. Salam, Jean, welcome back. But um, this is also going to be my acknowledgement of land for us today. Not only an offering, but also um, a memory of what I learned from Maryam Nizam. Uh, Farooq, uh, sorry, uh, Tawfiq Pasha Muraj, we friendly call him in a, we call him Pasha. Pasha, I'm waiting for him to join us. As soon as he can join us, he will talk to us about this. I've been actually looking at this plant. If anybody recognizes it, please let me know um, what it is, what you think it is. Uh, I've been actually thinking about redoing all the hedge that's around my house. And Pasha and I were talking about what would be appropriate, that's easy to look after, that's an easy replacement, that doesn't require too much water, that's not a fancy tropical plant. And this is something that's already growing in my garden. So I thought this would be great for me to talk about today uh, when he comes on board. Um, I'm hoping that he's not having any issues with signing on as some of our guests have had previously. Uh, he's not here yet. So as a quick introduction, Pasha is an extremely well-known name uh, all across Pakistan. He is the social and environmental activist that has the most amazing green thumb. Um, he's involved in education, in awareness raising, in helping people understand their gardens, their plants. He understands the soil and the earth like none other. He really is a son of the soil. He's lived here all his life. He lives on a beautiful, beautiful, very rustic, simple, old school farm. He's quite an amazing man, uh, extreme nationalist, loves Pakistan with every drop of blood in his body and that's um, rare de these days as we all know uh, to be that level of nationalist so um, he's quite an amazing man um, everybody in Pakistan knows him like I said but he's also very well known for his work um, as a landscape architect small projects large projects he's worked with me on the Karachi Zoo because he knows his plants he knows the care he knows the maintenance he knows what is, what is required of the soil what is required of the earth, what is the best thing to plant at what time, when. He's almost like the soil whisperer, you know, be anybody, anybody across Pakistan from Chitral to Hunza to Islamabad, Lahore to Karachi, anybody has a question that's complicated or that, that they don't have an easy answer to. And sometimes, even if it's something that Google doesn't have an answer to, we will come to Pasha and he's the man who will have these responses. So I still not signed in. I'm not sure if he's having internet issues or where he's at, I don't have a second phone to check up on him. But hi, Zulfi, welcome back. Good to see familiar faces. Actually, this is a good chance for me to have a quick chit chat with everybody who's here. Hi, Farooq. Uh, till Pasha signs on. Um, do is any anybody who's already here recognize this? Let's do this quick quiz. Who recognizes this plant? Um, and can get the spelling right. That's the real test. So, you know, we've been talking about geometry and alignment. Um, in the design world, there's a lot of coming. what's coming up nowadays, which is biomimicry, where we're going back to the roots, we're going back to nature, we're going back to finding the Fibonacci series in nature's design, in the plants, leaves, in their petals, um, in any of these little details in here. You'll find all the geometry that we're looking for for any kind of design form. And many times you'll find this sort of floral design that comes out of the arabesque, even in, out of simple geometry of a combination of squares and circles, the sacred geometry, the golden section, the um, uh, designs and patterns and motifs that you see in front and on the facades of the Islamic um, buildings, whether it's shrines, whether it's monuments, whether it's mausoleums, a lot of it is still fundamentally connected to the form that one will find inside every little detail and if I can take one of these out maybe I can show you Pasha is obviously having internet issues because he would have signed on by now so 
this is a really, I don't know if the camera will pick it up, really, really fragile. I don't know if I'm too close or too far. Really fragile, almost see-through iridescent. Very, very thin and sinewy structure. Uh, you can see the veins. Um, at the the focus on this phone is not able to pick up the finer details, but this is a very delicate little flower and it grows beautifully. You've got it, Zofie. This is absolutely what it is. It comes in several different colors. Um, uh, it comes in a white, which is my favorite because it keeps the structure visible and easy to see as opposed to um, being distracted by the color. And here is our man, now that we've had this Pasha is here. Yes, we have a winner. Let's see if he can sign on. Pasha! I don't see you. Now we're getting closer. Hey, Sam. Here he is. Good evening to you. Hi there. Assalamu alaikum. you. I had brought this along with me. As an offering and acknowledgement of land, I thought you would recognize it. It's a familiar plant and flower that you and I have been discussing for the outside of my house. Let me try and fix this also while I'm at it. Absolutely, the white bougainvillea. Uh, white bougainvillea. And I test with our audience to see how many people actually knew what it was. They got it right, which is... Uh, both of them pointing because I was hoping they would know and then I would have the opportunity to tell them. Um, just plugging my charger back in. The oven. And there goes the power. Sorry about that, folks. Pasha, can you see me? Can you hear me? How's the line? Oh, I, can, I can see you, hear you. You're well organized Sorry. with your lighting and everything. So Yes, my lighting. I finally sorted. So if you can move your camera down a little bit, we'll be able to see some more of your face, which would be lovely. There we go. There Thank you. Go. <laughs> Thank you so much. So I've just done an elaborate introduction uh, of you for you on your behalf. Right. Thank you. Thank you so very much. Everybody knows that we are very, very grateful that you've been able to take time out for me for this little initiative of ours. I know you're a busy man, shuttling between Karachi and Gada, uh, oh, sorry, Gadani, and I've seen yeah. that project. So, you know, we're not really, I, I don't want to really take up time talking about your work because this is not that kind of a chat. But you're a very special human being. And the thing is that whenever you and I sit down, we're always talking about your work, whether it's your project at Gadani for the cement factory or it's the Karachi Zoo or it's my edge, my house. So I thought that while we have an audience and I have an opportunity to embarrass you in public, I might ask some personal questions. So keeping in mind what we've been doing, and you know I do these architectural heritage tours, Jean and I over the Jugal Bandi series have been talking about you know, the cosmic alignment with the human um, and our connection, our alignment with the earth, the, rel the context and relevancy of earth, human sky, um, the constellations, the uh, electronic forces, uh, the electrical forces of the earth, how it goes through us, etc., etc., And how, you know, this is chat number 31. So I wanted to first put you on the spot by saying, why is it that you do what you do? I referred to you earlier as the soil whisperer, as the man who knows the earth better than anybody else in this country. So let's go back back, 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 someplace inside your essence, inside your spirit. Why do you do what you do, Pasha? What, what is about this, about the earth and the soil that draws you year after year after year, from your childhood till now? What is this? Um, I don't know anything else. It's definitely 100%. I can vouch for it. Not my fault. I didn't plan on getting into this. It's just that I opened my eyes um, with plants, right? So as a kid, I grew up 
in an environment where my parents were always involved with plants. That's what I grew up doing as a kid. I did everything else. Um, we used to play all types of games in those days, including Gilly Danda and Marbles and the Tops and but Pitu. also Petu and uh, always had plants in my hand at the end of the day. And uh, I, I feel I, and, and I hope the Lord is, uh, I feel that this was carved out for me. Um, and I do the Lord's work on earth. I, I mean, you know, might as well take credit for it. Um, <laughs> then I just grew up in it, you know, at the age of 13, my parents moved to a farm. Uh, I am that, you know, that uh, like a friend likes to call me the uh, leftover has been from the hippie generation. So, you know, the last tail end of the hippie generation that um, it was all, you know, I assumed that it was a laid back life and, and uh, uh, it was easy. And, and uh, it's just something that I continued doing. Sure, there were times in life when I may have had a choice that do I want to continue in this profession? I also had a, a, a secondary, well, that was actually a, the primary uh, um, profession was as a loss assessor and a quality quantity inspector, right? Easy. I've worked on, 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 on container ships and oil ships and, and uh, uh, done surveys of cars that got involved in an accident and, you know, evaluated plants and machinery. And I've done that too. Um, but of course, it didn't um, uh, suit my temperament. And um, so in time, I, I decided, and they, these were both my parents, my father's businesses, which my father and mother worked at together, uh, that I kind of inherited from them. And uh, I continued with the survey business for about 20, 22 years after my father died and I had taken over. Just, I mean, I proved it that I could do it and I was doing it and it's fine and I'm stopping it out of my own free will. Um, I think I, I uh, managed to uh, respect my father's name in the industry uh, after he was gone. And uh, enough was enough. I quit the survey business and I then concentrated completely on uh, the farm. And, you know, we obviously... Uh, you you evolve, and uh, um, I always claim that a farmer is only as good as his ability to change his crop from time to time. Okay, so the same way, uh, it, during my parents' times also, we evolved in what we were doing from growing flowers and strawberries and pan came out to a farm, then, you know, got into a more extensive nursery and then growing coconuts and then doing mainstream agriculture. And then I got into, you know, so we had a, we had the florist at the Hotel Metropole. I learned how to make a, and an exquisite bouquet, not what you get this bouquet, uh, these tennis rackets from the flower shops these days. Uh, so I can make, I can make a quality bouquet for you or a garland. Um, and growing the flowers and, and selling them. There you go. And uh, um, there you are. So um, constantly in the last 40 years, 45 years, I don't know how that is, and I'll be 35 very soon. So all my life, I have also done various things. And then I got involved in the uh, water conservation uh, and management and um, uh, started, uh, uh, you know, being an activist and, 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 and finding solutions and doing things on that front. Uh, and uh, generally then, you know, when you look around you, you see uh, the earth is hurting. So you start working for yeah. the earth. Then you see uh, either <clears throat> probably the only thing that I haven't really worked for are the animals. Uh, there's a lot of you and a whole lot of my friends who are working on that. So that's fine. I'll just take care of everything else. So I've done work for, you know, women's livelihood and, and, and creating awareness basically about uh, any of the injustices of, of society. So, and you know, Pasha, give a hand. you've hit three very heavy 
topics and you sort of like breeze past them. So I'm going to go back and pick up on these three. Um, the earth is hurting, you know, in a big way, and it's been hurting for a while. Climate change is a huge issue, and the generation now is experiencing climate change. But it's also almost too late to do anything about it because it should have been addressed 30 years ago, 40 years ago. So in terms of, uh, see, the work that I do, as you know, is about architectural heritage. So that's, that's a history that's in the built form coming out of the earth. But it's all dependent on the bioregion. It's dependent on the water. It's dependent on what you've taught me about the water tables. It's dependent on the ice that's melting in the mountains and coming down into the rivers. It's dependent on the soil that, you know, the silt that comes over from the floodplains. So I feel like somewhere between what I do and what you do, there is a connection. And the connection is that T-shirt which you're wearing that probably says Ma Dharti on it. What, well, what, this does, is, yes. what does the earth mean to you? What does Ma Dharti mean to you? I've, I've always said, and, and, and it sounds a little dramatic in Urdu, uh, but it's basically, um, it's the, the planet Earth, Mother Earth, it's, it's alive. It's like, like considered to be a human, right? right? So human has got, you've got your skin, which is, which is the outermost layer. That's, that's, that's the top layers of, of, of the planet. And every skin from different parts of your body has a different uh, thickness texture. and, and, and a cons you know texture. It has different abilities. Some is, is it, it feels the cold much. Your earlobes are so sensitive to temperature. You know, so the same way is, 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 is the, the, the top layer. You have, you have blood running in you, in veins. The Mother Earth, the, the planet has water running through. Uh, the rivers and, and the streams and the, and, 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 and the waterfalls and the ocean. It's all, I mean, look at it. It's, it's circulating around just like our blood is pumping around. Of course, deep down inside in her core, she has molten, molten earth from millions and billions, 6.4 billion years ago. But that's, so it, it's, it's, it's a living being. It's just in the shape of a planet. Um, we talk about going in, in search of, of, of uh, uh, different life forms um, on, on different planets. But, and then we say, look at the different various life form there is on the planet. But the planet itself is a life form. Yes. And when we get sick, one of the first ways we find out is, gosh, I think I'm feeling a little warm. You get a temperature. That's what happens. That's the first. But when you go to the doctor, he might give you something to bring your temperature down, but he will investigate to see that what infection does your body have that is causing the temperature. Right. So this, this is how I look at the planet. And, and for, for climate change, uh, we, were, we were very close to the tipping edge. Okay. And uh, Greta was asking for, was, was saying, do it right now. Stop fossil fuel, uh, uh, carbon emissions right now. Okay. And right. uh, the world was not really ready to do it right now. Uh, and we thought that we were so, so close to the tipping edge. But what this lockdown in the last five, six months has caused is probably 20 years worth of effort has gone in within the last five months because the fossil fuel production around the world has been greatly reduced. It hasn't come down to zero. It has, hasn't come down to 10%, but it is tremendously reduced. Okay. Uh, the the, the, the uh, uh, disposable life that we were leading pre-COVID has been reduced to some extent because our... Uh, venturing out of the home and doing all those things that we did that generated a whole lot of waste. I mean, now, now you don't see view as clean. There is no garbage to pick up because there are no people. So sea view has got a break for six months from human interaction that, you know, nature cannot do things overnight and rectify. It takes time. Nature can destroy overnight. You can have a, 
a, a tsunami that comes in and goes, cleans it all out. Building it back, nature takes its, because there's a lot of blocks that have to be first placed and moved around. The, the building blocks have to be put into place. And that is how it, so in six months, at least sea view and the sewage water has not been reduced, but the, this, this, the, the solid waste that was being thrown there is, is, has been reduced. So there has been a great effect, and I think it has been uh, a very expensive um, experience, lesson. But look around, people initially when this happened and the people started looking up at the sky and saying, blue skies, blue skies, blue skies. Around the world, people yeah. were showing their blue sky. Now they've got so yeah. used to the blue sky, it's no longer a novelty. The novelty of a blue sky and a clean sky and a clean atmosphere and being able to see across the city from a very tall building, that novelty has worn out. So um, this, 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 this has been living proof of what can be done to heal the planet. Uh, so that... Stop that. Battle of the cats in the background. Sorry about that. Not at all. So, you know, everything that we are living today we saw in science fiction, TV dramas and movies uh, 40 years ago, the man from uncle and I mean, get smart. He used to speak on his phone yeah. from his shoe, but basically cell phones and so much else around us uh, was fantasy at that time, 40 years ago. Um, today, what fantasy you watch is that the earth has become too hot and you know, all those things that you see are so easily possible or probable so this this all this is, is is showing us and this five months has shown us that what a difference a change in lifestyle can make towards the planet but isn't that you think that's i mean you think we learn something from this and be able to actually continue maybe not the lockdown but actually see how how easy it is to turn Turn time back a little bit. I mean, I know there are discussions today. I saw some pictures of the beach with litter on it, like somebody <coughs> just mentioned a minute ago about the gloves and the masks. But you know, the human the human race is really like stubborn and like slow. We're slow learners, and here you can see everything is falling apart. And yet, people when they are leaving, they are trashing the streets. They are polluting the streets. And now we see the, the PPE suits and the masks, the disposable masks, the disposable gloves. But the question I have for you, and I don't really want to discuss sewage and pollution because that's not really, yeah. I, I have a short amount of time yeah. with you and we can discuss how to handle pollution and all of that separately. But what is your, I mean, now that you know this picture, unlike anybody else on this group, you are constantly, you've got your hands in the earth, you're constantly planting, you're constantly pruning, you're watering. What is now, 40 years later, what do you feel is your personal relationship? You know, I have a personal relationship with animals, right? Any animal. Because over the years of working with them, you develop, you start listening to the language. So you, you must be listening to, to what the earth says. You must have deciphered her language. And you must have a personal relationship with the soil and the earth, whether you're in Karachi or you're in Gunza. Or, I mean, how do you feel about it personally? Um, Zen, um, appreciate that everything around us, um, and including us, um, comes out of the earth. Everything comes out. Um, we are all part and then we go back into the earth and get become, she's, you know, the recycler of. Uh, the recyclers, you know, there's no one to beat Mother Earth. Any Earth becomes Earth again and then comes out in a different form. Um, so my relationship with the Earth is, is just that. And, and uh, uh, um, it's so different from place to place to place to place. And the textures are different. The... Uh, composition is different, the characteristics of it are different, you know, the applications, the uses of it are different. I mean, so there's, 
there's the earth and there's there's water and then the elements fire and uh, wind i mean that's it that completes that is the earth that is me that is everything around um so i think uh, uh, we are we are one there's no difference as there is no difference i'm a tree a tree is me uh, i feel that uh, the earth so um and and again what did man so the evolution of of man on earth and man as of the human species let's let's be politically correct as well was yes. that um, yeah so the first thing uh, uh, they took shelter under was the branches of a tree and then they moved into a cave whether it was singular or plural singular probably first um and that was the dwelling and uh, uh, human beings had no option but to accept the available dwelling um but then as sense grew you realized looked at all the animals the animals don't make a make a dwelling which opens to the wind it's always got his back to the wind it doesn't want to get wind blown into its dwelling so if you go into any any of our outbacks you will find even the 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 tharis and everybody else they make their door opening not on on the west it's not a west open for them <laughs> Yes. It's an east open. They leave a small opening on the west side to draw in the breeze. They leave their front doors open, uh, and the wind is not blowing through their home. Doors and windows are not banging away. So, uh, as as the human beings evolve, they they learnt and they were in in tune with their environment. The houses were made completely according to the environment. Um, uh you know like like architecture did you had sloping roofs why do you have sloping roofs it looks very pretty yeah but it looked pretty afterwards initially it was utility for for rain and for snow to to slide down so uh till then it was all right and then when we started making our dwellings artificial that is where i feel that we disconnected from the earth as long as our dwellings were still connected to um uh the environment they were still rooted in the earth now the construction that goes on is not in sync with the environment and therefore it has no roots that is how a gardener speaks the building has no roots uh it's not connected that into the earth that's right the the wanted to actually start off with the the word roots because all of what my work is about those roots right trace the history back in the shared history the lost history to find out what are our roots and i think you hit the nail on the head that modernity and this contemporary capitalist mindset of the last let's say 100 years has uh, has basically taken these trees and disconnected the roots from the top so you know in your gardener term the whole that's why we have everything falling apart because there are no roots and i i i just i, I don't know but i think modernism has failed us to some extent i mean capitalism has and um, modernism then i think you know we tend to 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 uh, get stuck in a particular groove so i think we should in in life we should take the good from wherever it comes and work with those and um see because you know pakistan has a population of 220 million 220 million yeah. the sixth largest country in the world hey that's something you know um and when you have a population when you have people you have to feed them clothe them house them educate them give them health give them employment give them security all that i mean how do you feed 220 million people without using 
uh, a car. So you need transportation. You cannot function. Uh, there are regions in Pakistan where too much wheat does not grow. You have to take wheat across the country to those regions. You know, so um, it's not a hundred years ago when we had a pandemic, we had less than one fourth of today's population. Um, things were very different. Today, things are very different and they're going to be, they're going to move so quick, so rapidly. For us, change was slow. In the first 30 years, these last 10 years, change has been phenomenal. I have written letters and put them in an envelope, stuck a stamp and posted it and waited six weeks or so for an answer for it. That's how we used to communicate, even in even the business world used to do it. And of course, you know, phone calls was, remember what the phone calls were. Look how our life has changed. I see this changing dramatically over the next uh, 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 10 years. My God is going to be so different. Um, even, even agriculture, you know, all these vertical uh, 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 farms within urban centers that are going to come up, where they're going to draw, you know, multiple layers of um, there, there are limitations. You can't grow tall crops, so it all will be shorter crops. But you can grow tomatoes and and some other things like that. Um, will become a reality, um, and I don't find anything wrong in that as long as the feed that you are mixing and water and giving them is derived organically. It's not a chemical composition that you sit in the laboratory and you, you put the chemicals and psh, by magic you get plant food. So um, you can use the most modern of technologies and ground it with nature and it will work. This planet is amazing and human beings are amazing. We are destined to doom. We are destined to doom. But the struggle for not dooming is the journey. And there is always a chance that if everything works fine, then you could achieve that nirvana and not doom. So if you can, like, how many languages are spoken around the world? A couple of hundred languages. I mean, can you imagine there are 200 ways of making sounds that create languages? We've only invented three or four different types of engines, petrol, kerosene, uh, diesel, jet fuel, you know, and another couple more and water. So uh, imagine how many options there are for everything. So we just have to find those options which are um, uh, uh, which are not harmful to the planet, because you poke a poke a needle into her, you put a nail into her, it's going to hurt her. She's going to bleed, and sometimes injuries turn into festers, and it festers, 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 and then the whole body gets diseased. There you go. It's very simple for me, nature, environment, what tree to plant, um, what should the house over here on this piece of land be, what should be the design of this piece of land, every aspect of it, the earth speaks. You look at a piece of land and it tells you there should be a tree here, there should be a bush here, there should be a creeper here, the house should be there, there should be a little pond here, it just speaks. It's all very, 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 very common. Common sense. It's logical. What I can I say? Lost it. You know, any. Uh, it's very funny. I will, whenever I get a project, uh, professional practice, I will always go and see the site first. For this reason that you just mentioned, that you know, I don't hear it as clearly. I'm sure as you do, but I do hear something. 
I get a sense of the energy of what the the place, the land, that particular point wants for itself. Like you said, ponds, water, trees, and I find that at least in the design world, there is so much design, architectural design, that's done in the office way before ever seeing the site. There is a building in Karachi, a very famous building in Karachi, with a very famous architect behind it, who's, who's very, over the years, or in multiple conferences, has announced that uh, this building got built, I never went to site. And I always sort of hold my head and say, that's not something to be proud of, you know? <laughs> Proudly says. I mean, let's, let, let, let's, let's put it this way, there's a lady who's got hair up to here, um, uh, wants to have a haircut and a designer a hairstylist will turn around and say without even looking at her, without knowing, I'm going to cut your hair this way. So when the lady comes, irrespective of yeah. whether she even has that hair, it's not. It, it has to speak from, you know, that, that is, I suppose uh, our, our world did get into that uh, zen. There are certain uh, um, communities which you create uh, for workers, for, for officers, for, you know, different uh, categories or levels of, of, of people. And you make one model house and you make 500 of them or 3,000 of them or 5,000 of them. So you've got seven categories of houses starting from uh, 72 square yards going up to 500 square yards and you just print them out over there. That's because that is the need, right? Um, and then each individual who goes to live in that dwelling, uh, on the inside and outside, adds things that will lend his character to that building. When he moves out of there and takes everything else, everything away, all his furniture, all the things he had stuck on the wall, the landlord will whitewash it or paint it and then give it to somebody else. That dwelling will then absorb that person's personality into itself because he will then yeah. maybe not hang yeah. pictures or leave a bare wall. There you go. Yeah. So, uh, um, uh, but they must, they, they must, it must be grounded. It must be rooted. I mean, you know, you, you can't not, I mean, if, Anything that is grounded gets struck by electricity from the sky, doesn't get hurt. The electricity goes straight down into the ground, you know. How much sense does that make? It's, it's, it's so simple. So what happens? The whole world is going digital. Everything is online. Everything is on Zoom. It's all on Slack. It's on Instagram like we are today post-pandemic, uh, universities are suffering, businesses are suffering. How do we take everything you've said? And I know you work with a lot of social media because you have a presence, people follow you, you use it to communicate, to educate, to raise awareness. But now we have to scale it up, right? It has to hit global. It has to be a much larger scale. And it's potentially got to be a new way of thinking about the earth. A new educational curriculum, new content, a new way of creating communities. How do you think we're going to do this in a digital future post pandemic? Uh, Can we do it? Not being able to do it? Definitely, we'll be able to do it. But as long as all the effect is put into play. In the world, for Canada, um, there is still that outreach into the village system. It's complete across the board. Your 
Okay, I think we are back. I can't hear you. Are we back? Because the yeah, line was okay. All right. really bad. Okay. We haven't heard any of it. Okay. All right. So it is possible to do it. There has My to be an was, all out uh, uh, effort at awareness world, at various levels. Though Pakistan has, a, has one of the highest densities of per capita phones, uh, the reach is still a little difficult in certain places because people don't actually believe the narrator. Right. So even with COVID, what we found was that people don't believe that really something like this is there. It's just a conspiracy against us. So most things are taken off that way. OK, so but what you what you need to do is you have to always equate it with something that that person can relate to. When you re, when you can crazy. relate it for him, yeah. uh, he will be the first one to act. So what is required is an all out awareness program right. where every every citizen realizes that forget if I am burning something, but if that guy is burning some rubbish, dude, it's killing me. I have to go and ask him to stop it or then I report him. Our uh, agencies have to become those that are supposed to look after the environment uh, have to become very, very proactive, very proactive. Okay, I, right. I, I've just traveled the uh, uh, Lyari River. Um, I do that twice a week, once on this side, once on that side. At night, you can see the little fires burning. In the day, you can see the blackened concrete. Not only is it damaging the, uh, uh, you know, uh, the, it's, it's damaging that concrete, that, uh, that, that uh, uh, Lyari Expressway. Uh, uh, in time, it will weaken that structure uh, because it burns every night, every night, every night, and it's constantly burning. But the smoke is so thick at night that you can't drive past with your window open for the, in the car. So there should be, there should be zero tolerance for uh, atmospheric uh, pollution. There has to be... Uh, yeah, and... and and True. immediate uh, remedies for uh, uh, power generation. Pollution. So whether it's, it's from Heidel, but Heidel should be on the river, not water taken out. So it should just, the water should flow through a system and carry on flowing. It shouldn't collect that water and then give it somewhere for, for use. So that is, that is one of the issues which people don't actually talk about where the dams are concerned. Uh, you know, every single individual, look, I can only do as much as I can do, okay? So I, being involved in awareness, so I take the message to 100 or 1,000 or 100,000 people. But at the end of the day, each individual must at least do his two cents bit. So if, even if you can put up a, a, a small uh, uh, solar panel and run six of your lights at night off that, you should do it. Because not only does it take off a certain amount of load from the state, from, from the utility uh, that, is, that is generating that electricity, uh, uh, the load, as the load decreases, you know, because the more load we add on, the more they need to... to Put in a yet one more generating plant. So, if if every every uh, 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 basti and every kachi abadi had every household that rents this from a thousand rupees, they make a jugi. If each of them had one panel up there and their lights could be lit with that. So, apart from those people who don't have electricity, they would they would have an option and. You know, each one of us, right now I'm sitting in, in solar power. I mean, you know, you could put a generator for load shedding because in our area we get seven and a half hours of load shedding on a normal day. Uh, it's split into three uh, slots. But um, so I could put a generator and go bump, 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 you know, or a silent one or whatever. But no, I opted for, for solar because... 
I'm doing that little bit for the environment. Uh, that is three kilowatts of electricity less I'm taking from the national grid. At least wherever I can, I do drive a car. I'm sorry, I wish I could get around on a bicycle, but I can't. I, I have to go very long distances. So, um, but you know what I mean? So, you know, you now raise another important issue, which is that of governance, right? So if we're saying that, the, you know, uh, I say this for the animals, we discuss it with Aisha, with all the NGOs working on the animals, that the same thing that you're saying, that every citizen has to take responsibility to make sure that that dog on the street is not killed, not abused, not run over, and not poisoned by the state. So, you know, Shah Jahan, a few weeks ago, was on here as one of my guests. He said something very interesting that stick, stuck in my head. He said governance should be taken over by the scholars, by the universities, by the educators, and they should take on the responsibility of figuring out how to get these people, get civil society to mobilize, get civil society to understand the need for every individual to play a okay, role. It's in making the okay. world around them a if, better place. So that sense of community is missing if amongst us, Vasha. What if do you we see do about in that? Recent Nobody times, cares. Like, uh, and this, is, this has been a product of social media. They don't when we used to, all I mean, people would normally get that? around and hang out somewhere, and, and people would be meeting up with, with new people all the time in groups, and, and somebody would come into a conversation and hear a, a conversation, maybe give his opinion and then go away or, or, you know, the conversation would go on. Today, we are not doing that physical interaction. We are doing it on, on social media. And we, when we end up fighting with the people, we start abusing them. We right. go completely nuts on social media. That never used to, it, it would happen once in a while, but not as a general rule. Today, it has become a general rule. And today, if I turn around and say, this is a matchbox, there's bound to be somebody there who's going to say, no, it's not a matchbox. What do you do? So, so today, there are, there are difference. And today, difference of opinion, which is, which is also very good, because that is when democracy is, is <laughs> it has to be talked out and then you come up to conclusions that are not my way or his way, but the right way. So, um, but, okay, then that comes out of discussion, mutually agreeing on things. And anything that you don't agree with, you continue What's the right discussing way? them and bringing new points until one person or the other right. will concede. You get into a fight, pull out a knife and cut his throat, it's gone. Then his son is going to take revenge. See? So you, you keep discussing it. And okay. Now, um, um, right. I think what is needed also is, oh, oh, oh. The, 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 you are very right, the governance. Um, now, if somebody is, <laughs> is, is polluting, somebody is uh, digging up a road, somebody is... I mean, come on, dude. If you, as soon as the, 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 uh, you, you, the people come onto the superhighway or any of the uh, uh, motorways, they start driving like human beings. What happens to them? Because there's the motorway police there that hauls you behind to a side and gives you a big fat chalan. Simple. And you've got the autobahn where people, mm. there's a minimum speed, there ain't no maximum speed, there's a minimum speed, now, figuratively. So, uh, and it's a safe road to be driving on. Our roads are not safe. And yet in that madness, we don't even have 10% of the accidents we should be having on our roads. Um, but things have to be put into system. Things have to be put systematic. Everything 
I mean, it 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 happens in. Um, this has taken slow brainwashing of forty, fifty, sixty years that has brought us to this position. We are going to have to work. Oh, it's going to take time. There is no question of it happening overnight. Now we have to ensure that it doesn't take a thousand years to happen, but we have to ensure that it happens in the least amount of time. But you're going to have to work relation. You're going to have to work on them on a generation or two, on you know pick those five-year-old kids and start working on them, all the way up to the fifteen-year-olds. It's it's this is not going to happen in eighteen months or twenty nine to happen. You have, you have to teach them. You've always said this. I remember. Remember when we attended the water conference together, and um, there was this amazing presentation made by that very young. I remember. Uh, Uh, so that this presentation is popular because it was really profound to look at how we control her and the rivers, and like you said, don't separate them. Just use as it's going through. I'm forgetting his name off the top of my head, but a brilliant uh, presentation on the carbon. Um, but I remember back then, you know, and you've said this with all your projects that why are we not involving the children? Why are we not involving the younger generation? Reach out to them because this is their future. <coughs> and I love that about you that you're constantly saying we need to bring, like you said, the five-year-olds, the ten-year-olds, the fifteen-year-olds into this conversation, so that we can start handing out responsibility to them. And that's that's when the generation will take responsibility for itself. Right now. We see a generation that doesn't think it needs to be responsible for itself. It just says the state will look after me, and we know the condition the state is in. The state is in a state. So uh, uh, until the individual, like you said, doesn't keep putting in that two cents, two cents, two cents in is, a country of 220 million people is a lot of money. Is a lot of cents, a lot of ideas, a lot of energy to make change happen. Well, two cents But, into 220 uh, million is 240 million cents. That amounts to a fair amount of uh, dollars. 100%. Um, I, think, I think also then what it does is, you know, if, and the younger generation, um, sure, there is, there is a, a large number of youngsters out there doing a lot of things. Nowhere near enough. There's a lot of the younger generation that does this with their hand to you. I mean, and they are lost. You see, because they Don't have enough. they yeah. have Don't grown enough. up brainwashed in a particular way. So there is a huge population who yes whose thinking you will not be able to change. Yes, whose resistance you will have to bear for the next twenty five years. Twenty-five years, yeah, that's how long it's going to take. Consistently, if you work, consistently. There's and and it's going to be a struggle. And and when there is this kind of a thing, then then there oh, are maybe. there are sacrifices that will be made, whether it's sacrifice of life, sacrifice of property, sacrifice of reputation, um, uh, of personal gains. Um, There'll be a lot of sacrifice, and and you know we all know people who sacrifice their lives for uh, to bring about change. So um, you'll have to put in a lot of sacrifice, which means hard working. I mean, I give full credit to Samir Beg and 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 the Robin Hood Army. Look at those guys, man. Look at the way they yes. work. Look at Savina Khatri. Look look at these people. You know, look at your mother. Look at. Look at all these people, um, Sabrina, uh, 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 Salma Alam. Yeah. I mean, they're all around us. I mean, they're all around us. Look at that. How how people can can do it. So, um, I get very optimistic when I look around. Now we just need to 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 somehow 
uh, uh, get through this next 2025 years and uh, because people want a better life they want to live better now today's technology world digital world everybody in the smallest of village has somebody has a cell phone and they sit and watch the videos that come on on whatsapp yes. that's all over now the people know there's a better life there's a better world where you know these 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 that i counted out for you food and education and accommodation and health and security then they know that now this is a human right and and they they are entitled to it so yeah it's quite amazing actually so i you know get to travel to so many of these rural places because of these buildings that we're looking at and it's amazing when you talk to the thari people or you look at the jain temples that are 1000 1500 600 years old but you sit with the people in nagar parker they know the politics of the ngos they understand governance they understand exploitation because it's all available on the internet in their hands on their mobile devices they don't have laptops but they're so informed and they all want a better life yes they have a problem with water also understand the politics of water then, and they understand then 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 ancestry and they feel really like jilted that we now, want her, like you said we want a better life for her, our children for our future one question. and how can we make it happen is the goat and the cow the <clears throat> an indigenous animal of the desert who's drinking more water the humans or the animals of thar every family has every family of no. eight people has at least 20 head of cattle no right uh so yeah, the, the for animals, forever for since, sure. since the first people moved into the thar desert um uh yeah. when they moved they in were, there they had yeah. uh a couple of goats and a cow or two cows um and as their numbers have grown so have the numbers of the animals grown uh and the animals numbers have grown much more they always relied on the animal like almost and the thari's are traditionally been nomadic people um then they finally settled down but they are still even after settling down they are still nomadic um now with these uh, artificial political boundaries yes. where they can't cross that restricts them and has changed um that has probably changed the way they lived for thousands of years partition uh, uh, may have affected that as well anyway so their their wealth is in their livestock it's it's like the 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 uh, um uh, the 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 masai in in the masai mara they they the animals um started uh, uh uh becoming a problem and uh, once you over exploit the environment it starts dying out on you right you took out too much water and the ground water gets depleted you take out too much water from the river and the river run dry so the same way when you are taking out the thari's are doing is taking out water and feeding the animal they are running out of water three times as fast as they would normally have done or they may not have 